Wow. 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 It's a summer Sunday. It's a summer Sunday. Who wants to play? I wonder what everybody's doing on this summer Sunday. Seems like the sun's coming out all over the world. And that's a cool thing. But we're going to sit and talk for just a second. Cover some uh, cover some topics. <laughs> lay down some knowledge. Lay down some uh, analysis of what's going on. And most of all, I wanted to get a, an interactive uh, conversation going with y'all. <laughs> At least those of you can spare some time. On this summer Sunday, maybe out on your back patio with a laptop. Stone cold, you know. It's a summertime in the city or in the country, depending where you is. Raptor Jesus is dremeling. Everybody working on their projects and whatnot. Thanks for coming back to Rune Hammer. Who nanny? Who nanny? Hey. Who nanny? Oh, look into the sky, see a giant bug crawling. Look at all the tank turrets on that big bug ballin'. Oh, gonna level a town. We got to get inside and bring the beast down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, that one is actually pretty cool. <laughs> hey guys, greetings to all sentient beings. Tamaste, natemas, falunda, <laughs> Yo, buddy, Ingrid Bernal here, back here at Rune Hammer. We're chilling once again. Hello, everybody. Okay, I want to just break some stuff down today. Nothing mind-bending, but I wanted to answer questions that come up so many times, they're worth answering. That's what Q&A is all about, and you cannot do Q&A without a nice cold beverage. These things are amazing. When you're drinking beer like every day for 20 years, these are pretty damn good. Ah, and ice cold on a nice sunny day like today. So I got, before I go back in the yard and uh, feed the turtle, it's time to lay down some knowledge. All right. So, hey, everybody. What's up? I'm talking about tools. So let's get into the tool stuff first because it's really what everybody's one wanting to know about. Okay. So if you're getting ready to get into what I've been calling the RPG underground, if you're thinking about creating some material to put out there, whether it's on the DMs Guild your own drive through RPG material, or maybe for your homies at home, you want to you know, spread a new game design around to them. Say like, you guys, we should try this game design I did. All cool dungeon masters do that. So hell yeah, you're thinking about doing that. Okay, so when you start thinking about doing that, you need the tools to get it done. And right away, you're like, oh man, I got to drop a dime on this stuff. Now, there's really two big approaches. Whoa! Hey, what's up, Ian? Thanks for the big old tip, man. That's my beer money tonight. Woo! <laughs> Why did I do a Tarzan thing? I don't know. So the first thing you think is like, whoa, it's going to cost me a dime to like go to professional level on tools. So here's my advice before we get into the list of tools that I use. Before you worry about your tools, take a look at what it is you really are wanting to do because you might not need all the cool stuff. Okay, now I'm a real hard ass about quality tools, but if you're just trying to get like something for next weekend for six people and you just want to sort of propose a new game design, you don't need anything. You need like a notebook paper and a pen. You're good to go. But we're even going to talk about what tools to use on that front. But the minute you get into like bringing it, whether it's to DMs Guild or to Drive Through or even straight to like POD, like that's print on demand. We're gonna talk about those tools too. If you're even getting into any of this stuff on a larger scale, just you've got to trust me on this. Quality tools are going to save you so much headache. Now, is that a big deal? If this was a job, it wouldn't be a big deal because you're like, you're, you're getting paid. You kind of, you know, you commuted down there. You know what I mean? You're there to work anyway. So if the tools aren't that great and you have a little bit of frustration, that's okay. That's part of almost every job that all of us out there are working, right? But this is the funny thing about doing creative work like for a hobby. If you get frustration with your tools, you get like those negative chemicals in your brain that are associated with doing your hobby. 
and you get this this danger that so many t people talk about, which is when you turn your passion into your job, right? Like you start to hate it. This is the last effect you want to have on yourself because it can make you not like doing the hobby. The hobby's got to be fun or it's not a hobby. It turns into jobby. Hobbies, cool. Jobbies, not so cool. This is why there's not a store called Hobby Jobby. No one wants to go there. <laughs> okay, so anyways, quality tools become important. Okay, but if you're just going to get in and maybe you just want to write one adventure, okay, maybe you just want to make five pre-gen characters, then don't worry about this video. Don't worry about tools. Don't worry about any, any of it. But the minute, and any of you out there who ever tried to make like a chair <laughs> or a table or like landscape your backyard, you know in the first hour, if you're doing an actual sort of semi-scale project, the tools are clutch. If you buy the cheapest shovel at Home Depot and go home and try to landscape your backyard, you like break your shovel in the first hour, you have to go back to Home Depot. Everybody's done this before, I know it. You go to Home Depot two, three times. On the third time, you're buying the most expensive shovel and you've already wasted the money on the broken shovels. And that's generally my mindset with doing creative publishing. Get the good shovel. Okay, so if you're just going small, just use pen and ink, okay? And that's where we're gonna start. So where's mine? My level of preparedness is so low. I was just drawing on it while I was uh, eating dinner. Anyway, <laughs> I work at Hobby Jobby, yeah, that's too good. Okay, so if you're just doing pen and ink, do yourself a favor. Get Uniball Gel Elites or Uniball Bold Elites. Okay, you can, you can quote me on that. Uniball Gel or Uniball Bold Elite. Now these are slightly more expensive pens, but why do you want this particular pen? Why am I such a jerk about it? Like, like pen matters, am I really that obsequious? Do I really look down on people so much I think what the best pen is in the world? No. The beauty of it is that in RPG work, a lot of times you're both writing and drawing. You're both filling in as well as writing quickly. But you also want to do thick underlines or maybe even boxes with little shadows, right? You guys have all seen how I do my journal. The great thing about this pen brand is that the ink flow is like massive. Don't you hate it when you're trying to use a pen and you go from writing mode to drawing mode and like the line is inconsistent as you're drawing? I, that like drives me insane. Or if I'm trying to fill in a little dark area and I like miss little spots and I have to go back over that, I, uh, I hate that crap. Now, if you're drawing page after page of dungeons and like arrows and boxes and filling in little, the little black on the skull's eyes, which I don't know about you guys, but I do that like 400 times every day. The pen's gonna matter. So do yourself a favor, get Uniball Gel Elites or Uniball Gel Bold. Now the difference is that the bold has I think a 0.7 millimeter tip. That's a big tip on a pen. So you get like a, boom, you get a burly black gel ink line. Now one thing with gel ink, you gotta watch where your hand is sliding, boo. If you're sliding around and like your hands on that, that drawing while you're writing the notes for the dungeon, you're gonna have all kinds of spread and smear and you're gonna be sad panda and if you're sad hobby no fun you do less hobby become hobby jobby no good right you fall down that slippery slope again so get yourself the dope pen and watch out where your hand is hanging out now as far as paper a lot of people just use whatever's laying around and that's totally cool you know the good old spiral college rule is like timeless but if you're using these pens in two seconds you're going to realize like the pens are going right through the paper you can see it on the other side you're angry you got like ink bleed going and you just like, Hankerin's led me astray again with his drunken ass ramblings. <laughs> so if you want to do it right, what you need is something you want, usually want to look for archival paper. Or you can do archival weight or heavyweight, like 70 pound. Uh, I think this refers to how much one ream of the pages weigh. Um, and so what you'll see in a lot of quality sketchbooks is you'll see this 70 pound paper and it's like ultra opaque. So you can do full fill-ins on one side, sometimes even with a Sharpie and then hold it up and you won't get much see-through at all, even when holding it up. And it's cool. Now, why do you, it's gonna cost you double. Trust me, if not triple, what a spiral college rule is gonna cost you. But if you guys are like me, your notebook is your, is your holy place. It's like your altar where you worship the hobby of RPG making. 
And so I really believe the one thing you really should drop a dime on and be happy with is not the latest $50 source book. It's your journal. That's where you should put the 50 bucks. I really do believe this. And then as part of this tool advice, I got to give you a little, a little tip. When you get this notebook, like a nice one like this, a nice sketchbook with archival paper, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to not want to ruin it. <laughs> you got to overcome that. So my tip is on the very first page, like right when you get home, pull the shrink wrap off it, open it up, write your name, the date, and like draw a little happy face with horns on the first page, like right away, just defile that thing. Just, mm. and then like a big spiral or like sometimes I'll do like a, a weird looking rune shape or something. Just do it. Or sometimes I'll draw like a teeny little house down in the corner. It just gets me going. It makes me know I've already ruined this damn notebook. I can move on. Okay, so that's that's your low, low, low level tool set that I use. And I use it every single day. And I know a lot of you guys out there uh, who just carry the damn thing in your pocket like every single day. Actually, um, uh, Michael Maitland from AtCon was showing what he had in his pockets, like his survival kit for Atcon. And he had this notebook. It looked like a private detective had this thing in his back pocket for like 25 years. <laughs> like no joke. This, this notebook was straight fam to this guy. So anyways, live that notebook life. You're going to thank me. And nothing is better for getting the tactile feel of creating what we love about this hobby than putting ink on paper by hand. Okay, there you go. So that is the most fundamental level. Now, between there and the publishing tools we're gonna to talk about are all kinds of cool things, like card stock and index cards and blank index cards and Sharpies and silver Sharpies. I freaking love silver Sharpies. So let's say you're doing the index card method, which is timeless. I mean, there's a reason I called my RPG that. You're drawing like, that you have a magic sword you wanna hand out and make a card for, for like tomorrow night's game. So you draw a silly little sword on an index card. You're just like me, you can barely draw, so you're just like, that kinda of looks like a sword. Then you get your silver Sharpie and you like fill in the blade. Suddenly it looks super cool. Then you write your cool little stats underneath. Then when the time comes, boop, you hand that to your player. Ooh, they will covet that for life. Another cool thing you can do with silver Sharpies is little curly cues on the corners of your index cards. They're in silver ink and for some reason, I know this is cheesy. It just makes the cards feel really, really cool. <laughs> Talk about 100% unjustifiable opinion. That's the BS level that this channel has reached. Draw curly cues on the corners of your index cards with a silver Sharpie and it will be straight fire at the table. You know what I'm saying? All right, here's to that. Okay. Those are the most fundamental tools I can recommend to you. And I don't care how far you take things. You need those. You need a badass notebook that you love that's yours. You need damn good pens. Get Uniball Gel Elite. Get those things. Get a box of them like on Amazon right freaking now. I don't have an affiliate link. I don't have time for that. Go get those things. You need those. Then we've got the interim tools. Card stock sheets, index cards, silver sharpies, sharpies. And all of the small sort of cardboard and uh, home makeable print and play stuff that you can bring to a table that really elevates a table. Then we get all into miniatures and all this other stuff, but we want to get into publishing tools. That's really what the video today is about. So for those of you who have asked so many times, I hope this video is just a final, uh, okay? And I'm not going to show you a bunch of cool prices, right? Pictures of all the stuff I use. I'd rather you just look at my mug. Look at this guy. I play RPGs every damn week. Oh yeah. Okay, you're looking to publish, all right? You've, you've written an adventure or uh, maybe a new class or maybe some loot or a dungeon or you've got some monster designs that are really cool, but you're like, oh my gosh, these are dope. So you're gonna need some tools. And this is, by the way, regardless of which aspect you might be doing, I recommend that you learn the tool set because when you get the set, that's when you really start to own the process. If you don't get the sort of tool set and the knowledge that goes with it, you're gonna be relying on other people and a lot of times that can involve paying them and that again can give you those negative endorphins and you don't want those because then you got Hobby Jobby going. And you don't want a Hobby Jobby, you wanna hang out in Hobbyland, all right? So 
if you can keep it internal or like stick with like f your fam homies, like straight squad, you know what I mean? Then you're not going to be throwing a bunch of cash around and you know the damn tools. Also, even if you do pay somebody, let's say you pay somebody to do a video for you. Because uh, if you're publishing on Drive-Thru RPG, having a video boosts your sales like by 4x. But then you get the video, the dude has moved to Finland, you're never going to hear from him again. And he did the logo wrong on your thing. And you're like, now what do I do? No big deal because you got the tools. You can fix it your own self. Boom. All right. So the order that I want to hit you with tools is, is not an accident. So, yeah. So the order that I'm going to hit you with the tools goes from sort of the order of escalation of your involvement in publishing. All right. So remember, we're starting all the way back down pen and journal. <clears throat> pen and journal is where you learn to make pages, to make layouts, to think clearly, to think on paper, to look back at your own work and wonder, is it still cool? That's a huge part of publishing. But because believe me, sometimes you get those Shia LaBeouf moments where you're sitting in this dark theater watching a movie you made like 10 years ago and you're just weeping because you hate what you did. You're ashamed. You don't want to be Shia LaBeouf in that particular situation. You want to be Shia LaBeouf in the Elastic Heart video where he's totally awesome. So that's what we're going to do. All right. Focus, power. Tamaste. All right. First of all, you're going to get into digital drawing or some form of digital writing. Now, even if you are swearing by just typing into your computer, at some point during any digital publishing project, you're going to need to edit some images. And if you're homie drawn like meme style with impact font and drawn with your mouse and it's all like janky and sawtoothy, you're not cool. And people aren't going to want to read your stuff even though it's really well written because your art was drawn with a freaking mouse. So you're going to be confronted with this thing right away. I need a drawing tablet. Here's what you need to get started. This sucker right here. Get, it. get over here. Criminy. Look at this little guy. This is the latest miniature from Wacom. Okay, and I, I, it used to be called the bamboo. So I have a bamboo over there as well that I, I used so much it actually wore the surface off. You can like see the weird cyber stuff underneath. It looks like solar panels kind of underneath there. This is what you want. You want a little six inch Wacom tablet, just like this guy. Look at this little dude. This guy's great. And you can get a wireless one too if you pay an extra 20 bucks and then you don't have all this shenanigans going on. Um, I don't know the model number. What am, what, what am I? Best Buy? No. You just want this tiny little Wacom tablet. You can hook it up to any laptop. You can sit in the living room and watch Legion while you're while you're drawing on your computer like a cool person. And yes, it's going to be a little bit weird in the beginning, but you can do it. All right. Here's your first difficult moment. If you're going to get into digital drawing with a little Wacom tablet, you're going to need digital imaging software. Now, some people will tell you, we'll just get GIMP or one of the other sort of freeware or micro pay type image editing things. But here's why I'm going to have to just hit you right in the, right in the, in the jimmy, right in the jewels, right in the family treasures. Mm. Ah, just like Matthew McConaughey. I'm just going to jump right away. If you want to get into digital drawing, get freaking Photoshop, get the Adobe Creative Cloud trial for free for a month. Start working in Photoshop. Why? People are pissed off because the, you get it on a subscription model and they think it's too expensive. It's a ripoff and all this other stuff. Here's why. It's not because Adobe Photoshop is the best thing ever. It's because you will wind up using it if you pursue this anywhere beyond just dabbling. And the free trial is a month, so you can dabble for free. But if you go beyond dabbling and you use something like GIMP, the problem is not that GIMP sucks. GIMP is fine. It's that you will develop really messed up productivity workaround habits. And when you finally upgrade because you made a cool thing and you didn't hang with your homies who use Photoshop and then you get Photoshop, all your muscle memory and your habits are all weird and twisted because you've been using these bonko cheap tools. So don't do it right away. If you get into digital drawing, boom, get your bamboo tablet and get a free trial of Adobe freaking Photoshop. It's not rocket science. All right. Now, before long, you got to throw down. You can get essentials for super cheap. It's a stripped down version of Photoshop. It's mega cheap. You can get it for like seven bucks a month. It's nothing. Now this monthly thing, you're freaking out already, but here's where we're going to take it next. This is why this is clutch at the beginning 
to just throw down on Photoshop. One, you get the good tool habits. Two, you're going to wind up with all the other shit. <laughs> okay, and that just means the whole software suite. And that is, these are the ones that I use. Remember, I'm not just throwing smoke here. This is like what I do. You're going to use Adobe Premiere to do all your video creation. You're going to use Adobe Audition to do your podcast, to do the sound for your videos or music for your music platform, whatever the hell, sound effects for your VTT, anything, right? And then for the the final, the, the godfather of them all, you're going to use Adobe InDesign to create books, straight up books or pamphlets or whatever. Now, this video isn't here for me to slam dunk you about how to use all these tools. What I'm saying is that like the stuff you guys see me doing, I do on the Creative Cloud and one subscription gets me everything and gets me constant updates because a lot of the cheaper things seem really cool for a couple weeks, but they fall out of awesome. And also as your skill develops, some of those cheaper tools, you're like, man, what am I doing? Using Sprite Maker Pro, I must be out of my freaking mind. Okay, now not to diss on Sprite Maker Pro, somebody out there probably wants to use that. But this video is about the tools that I use to do this sort of crazy thing that you guys see me doing where I'm publishing on multiple fronts. Now the output of this is what you guys see me doing. It is product for print on demand, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. The days of stockpiling books are freaking over. Really the quest now for a, 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 a independent publisher is finding the highest quality and best customer service on print on demand. But these are like a bunch of robots that print books as they're ordered rather than stockpiling a ton of books. Besides stockpiling kills trees way more than need to be killed all for profit margins at the end of the year where there's these huge warehouses filled with books that no one ever bought, but the profit margin looks cool. Don't be that way. Be independent. Use print on demand. Drive through RPG is not only one of the main print on demand, they use a, a service called one bookshelf. They are definitely not the highest quality. Um, I think uh, Lulu is actually one of the best ones, but in some of the other ones, you're going to get better results sometimes, but they don't have that built in marketing tool or component that drive through RPG has. That's so powerful. So now we're really getting into the obscure stuff. So you've made a beautiful PDF. It can be used by print on demand machinery. You're ready to go. You want to use drive through RPG now as a marketing tool. And this is where you kind of get into the crazy side. This is where you want to be making a video for your book or for your module. You, you know, and then maybe you want to edit some sound or you want to do narration. And so you've got Adobe audition and then you need a good microphone. You need a decent camera. The cameras that I use, I use a Logitech CS 90, I think or CS 920. It's the main one that everybody uses. You guys bought me that camera. The microphone I use is a blue snowball. You guys bought me that microphone um, and the patrons bought me that, but a lot of the tips in YouTube, YouTube bought me this stuff. So there was a whirlwind tour of my digital tools. Now, finally, if you really get into the art side, especially, that's when you're going to go to my, my grandest tool. And we're going to talk about my two sort of high end art tools that I use. So as you guys know, I am doing art constantly. I mean, it is a lifestyle. Now, obviously like doing an independent RPG company and publishing label <laughs> all by yourself, it is really cool because there is a lot of independence and you don't answer to anybody. But make no mistake, one of the tools you're going to need is like self-discipline. If you really want to be in it, it it's, it's constant. And, and I often say that the difference between crafting and art is that crafting is fun. <laughs> Art is like some kind of weird affliction, like nothing is ever good enough. You're constantly trying, you're constantly working and, and pushing yourself and dissatisfied with your art and pushing and pushing and pushing. So, no, no, no new goggles yet. I got no spectacles, hopefully next week. I know, I look like a wizened old... Where are my shorts? Anyway, final two tools. Uh, I want to show you and there is some key differences. The first one is the remarkable tablet. So while you're uh, hanging out on the video here, jump open a new tab and go take a look at this thing. The remarkable tablet is right here. Oh, here's mine. Oh, I just dropped the pen. Here's mine. Well, that's the back. Okay, so here's mine. This is a 
non-luminous drawing surface. So this is not like an iPad or a laptop or anything like that. There's no back illumination. It also is not a microcomputer. So you don't check your email and browse and watch videos on this thing. This is exclusively a sort of drawing editor. Now it can load PDFs and you can like write on them and circle things and save it out and stuff. No. Those features, honestly, on the Remarkable, I have to say, are horrible. The, the interface for it is a bit slow. The loading and the exporting for it is abominable. It's not good. So you don't want to be using it to import a bunch of complex stuff, edit it, and export it and stuff like that. But as a drawing tool, this is the absolute cutting freaking edge. It is amazing. So this is just from, uh, from AtCon. I was hanging out and drinking beer while everybody was showing up to AtCon and I just did this little doodle on here uh, just as sort of like a cool AtCon poster or something. Um, but if you see, it's it's it almost has that Kindle-like quality where there's no illumination in it. It actually functions on sort of micro, um, like magnetic dust, I believe. And then the dust is uh, like the... Uh, like arrangement of the microparticles is saved as a PDF on the cloud. How insane is that? So all your work is always on the cloud. So you never have to hit save. Um, here, I can show you some of the other sort of recent gibbledy bits. You know, you guys know that I do um, tattoos for people as well. So here's a recent tattoo that I did. But this, the, the feel of this is absolutely amazing. Now you're gonna shell out some serious ducats for these things. I think they're 500 bucks or so. But you cannot check your mail on it. It's micro thin, it weighs nothing. The battery lasts an eternity on this thing, like days. <laughs> it's amazing. But the interface and special features like scaling and selecting and stuff, they're all horrible. Really, you wanna think of it almost as like drawing with a Sharpie. You know how when you draw with a Sharpie or just draw with a pen, um, with no pencil, it's there's a lot of commitment involved. So you use filling and overdrawing rather than erasing. And if you use that mindset with the Remarkable tablet, oh my God, the thing is freaking genius. It's amazing. I love mine. I go everywhere with it. I draw like a crazy person, especially if I want clean digital output. Now remember, always drawing in your journal. But if you really need clean digital output, like for your published material, <laughs> then you use your Remarkable, you get home, fire up the app, you pull down the PNGs, which are high-res PNGs, throw them in your work, and it looks cool. The second big tool, and I want you to go look this up too if you're not familiar with it, I use a Cintiq 22HD. So I'm talking right into a Cintiq at this moment. It is a gigantic draw-on monitor. Now a lot of people have a hard time with using drawing pad tablets because you have a detach between what you're seeing for your line and where your hand is, and you're like, Arr! but on the Cintiq, you draw right as you would naturally draw. Now they are super expensive. They've come down a lot over the years, but as far as a hobby level investment, this stuff is super expensive. Now I'm looking at the new Dwarven Forge Kickstarter and there's mad people throwing down at the $4,000 level. Instead of getting some resin terrain, you can get an infinite life of artwork on a Cintiq. That was the cheesiest plug. So the Cintiq absolutely cannot review it highly enough. They last an eternity. They are ultra durable and they are simply genius, intuitive. And it's also your monitor. So it's just like, it's invisible in your workspace. Brilliant, best tool ever for a digital artist who does the kind of things I do. Now, if you're not a full on artist, do you need a Cintiq? Probably not, but I still advise getting at least something to do some imaging with because it's, it's inevitable. You're going to want a little custom box. You're going to want to draw a little border. You're going to make your own little thing. At some point, you're going to want to make your own little thing. You need some kind of little dink donk. So these are the tools that I use to get the dink donks done. Yeah. Now I want to show you something as you're considering um, Remarkables and Cintiqs and stuff like this. Whoa. All right, so if you look at this drawing of a troll over here, I want to show you something. So this is a 100% view. So uh, recently I did this commission uh, of these troll species. 
and the troll species needed you know some details some lore and some some detailed concept work so they could be made into miniatures so this drawing that you're looking at right now is taken straight off the remarkable now if we go to 200 percent look at this you see this how it's absolute pixels now that's probably going to bum you out you're going to think to yourself like oh god that's horrible trust me when it's at native resolution all that is fine it has a very crisp great look to it more like what you're seeing right there but it does have a tremendously sharp appearance so if i get say my icrpg um brush that i always use right i really only use two brushes we're going to talk about that in just a second too so this right here it's a, a hard elliptical brush that's a little bit squished that's just black super simple that's how i did all the art in index card rpg but take a look at the at the the feel here at the difference so let's do some dots okay now let's get in there and take a closer look you see that so when I work on the Cintiq and I work directly in Photoshop, I do get this like smoother look, but in some ways it's a bit softer when it's published on paper. Um, the hard look can be really kind of cool. And so if any of you guys are familiar out there with my PDF, Blood and Snow, all the art in Blood and Snow is done on uh, the Remarkable tablet. So it has this really gritty, really nice, sharp look to it. Whereas Index Card RPG completely lives in the domain of drawing with the pen. So if you look here, this is a little bit of both. So I got my general sort of silhouette design on my Remarkable, and then I came into Photoshop. And I now want to show you the only other brush I use. So those of you who are familiar with Photoshop or digital drawing in general, you know about brushes, right? So you see this kind of area right here where it has a little bit of fade and it has a little bit of crust in it. It's almost a photographic amount of data that's hidden inside there see it's like lint <laughs> okay so this is the only other brush I use I'm going to show you I'm just opening up all my bag of tricks here it's right there this is a, a, a brush by an artist called Sparth who is the primary concept artist at um, 343 responsible for um, Halo brilliant if you go to a website called gum road you can download sparth's brushes and this is his brush called complex triangle now if you look when i ease up my hand there's all this noise hidden in this brush see that there's like noise hidden in it so when i want to do something with a softer kind of layered look with some noise in it this is what i use it has a much more scratchy kind of feel to it and it's also triangular, so it leaves all these kind of interesting edge shapes going on. So just so you have an idea, there's that. There's what it looks and feels like, right? And then let's go back to the ICRPG brush and you can get this feel. So squish it to elliptical. And then look, see how clean and like ultra simple this one is. This one's like Sharpie. So even when I let up, I don't get any noise. I just get a thinner line. And those are all settings that you can do in Photoshop as far as how you set up your brushes. But those are really all of the art I do. Color, black and white, grayscale, everything. Those are the brushes that I use. Okay. Whoa! Oh, God dang, I hate that. I hate that mode. Okay. So, there you have it, pretty much. Now I'm gonna, let me get, see, make sure I can see everybody chatting there. There we go, there's everybody. By the way, saying thanks for the little tips there, folks. Appreciate that. I owe you a drink. And yes, I am back on YouTube. I'm back with a freaking vengeance. Now, I know that it's uh, hard to predict when my streams come on. Being live is a bit of a bonus, but uh, I'm archiving almost everything except drunken ranting. So I've been following that rule for a while. I'm going to keep doing that. But uh, I have found that my output is much more natural and frequent if I don't schedule. The only thing that's going to be scheduled is what I want to talk about next. Okay, so that's all my tools, you guys. I do a lot of miniature work. You guys know that I do sculpting. Um, I also do acrylic paint, uh, and I make terrain and all that stuff, but that tool set is so much better documented by far more skilled people than myself, like Pilly Pow, like Wylock, like Scotty, even like the old school originators like DMG, yo, what up? Those guys really started it, and they, they lock it down. And I love some of this cardboard terrain craft that's starting to come up lately. It's Sharpie plus 
corrugated cardboard, you get this like really homegrown look. Our hobby is continually morphing and evolving in wonderful ways. Boom. All right. So I'm not going to talk about my whole terrain sculpting thing because honestly, I'm a hack in that department. But as far as publishing RPGs, for some bizarre reason, Thor must be trying to teach me some cruel lesson. He hasn't revealed the punchline yet. Index Card RPG has been tremendously, tremendously, tremendously successful. Um, and so I would like to think that's at least in a little bit in part because I, what I've been talking about on the RPG Underground series of which this video is a part. It's basically saying we need to create what we want out of this hobby, not buy it. And it's not easy, it's not cheap, and it's not fast. But it is the coolest stuff out there, I think, is the independent work that I see people doing. Now, obviously, some of the bigger publishers are made up of independent people, and I understand all that's not lost on me. Um, you know, I have been critiqued in the past for ranting and raving about some of the most successful people in our hobby, like I'm envious or jealous or something. Maybe I am envious and jealous. Is that so wrong? I mean, I want to be the best. I see people at the, at the top of it, and I'm kind of like, oh, well, they're not as cool as I am. Come on, let's all be honest. Everybody feels a little bit of that. I don't want to tear them down. It's not about that. It's just I really do believe in the small-time, independent kind of thing. And I think it's true in a lot of creative venues, like music and even film. Sometimes when things get big, they're just not quite as cool as when they were a little smaller. I mean... I'm not hating on anybody. I'm just kind of saying that's how I feel, all right? This is what I'm saying. Okay. So once you get into InDesign, that's when you can really start doing bookmaking. You can do layout. You can do print and play sheets. So I really hope everybody goes and takes a look at some of the stuff that I've done in that area because I hope that there's more of it happening in the near future. Getting lots of fun print and play material with a PDF is uber, uber fun. I really enjoy it. It gets the scenario on the table in physical form very, very quickly. And um, the Pathfinder pawns are really what turned me on to that whole 2D mindset. And then being able to present my own custom stuff. Is my custom stuff as cool as Wayne Reynolds' art in Pathfinder? Hell no. But it's my stuff. And that's what I think the RPG Underground is all about. That's why you're going to all this trouble, right? Because you want to make it. It's DIY, baby. Woo! Okay, now we're going to talk about the next thing I want to talk about. So if you're really just here for DIY RPG publishing tools, you can just get the uh, uh, because I'm done talking about that part for now. Now I want to get into really asking you guys, all 140 of you, which is awesome, very directly. I need advice on this one. I'm not sure what to do. I am terribly, terribly excited about my new channel and my new sort of creative endeavor the Dungeon DJ. So this is me playing a two-hour set of completely bizarre, progressive, slamming, ambient, weird, creepy, sort of suggestive, cinematic music that is, at least in mindset, created to back a really fun, dangerous, scary D&D session. So that's the Dungeon DJ. I started a new channel to do it because I was worried about like spamming you guys with what might not be considered like core material for Runehammer. But I'm here to ask you straight up right now in the comments, just throw down you guys, what do you think? Should I just put those live sets? It's going to be every Saturday at seven. Should I just throw those live sets right into Runehammer or should they be a separate channel so they don't get in the way of all the sort of core material? And then we're going to talk about everything that's going to go down in July. So what do you guys think? Should the Dungeon DJ live on a separate YouTube channel, which is what I was going to do? Or should I just combine it right into Runehammer? Should I just keep being Runehammer and nothing but Runehammer? What do you all think? There's 140 of you hanging out. So what do you think it'll be? Do, 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 do. You don't get to say yes. It's multiple choice. <laughs> Throw them on Runehammer. Put it up. Rune Hammer. Keep it tight. It fits perfectly with Rune Hammer. Oh, okay, okay. Nice, nice, nice. Thank you, you guys. All right, great. So, like, why bother just making an entirely new YouTube channel that has 200 subscribers and flirt a dirt? That's awesome. So, we're just going to get way more views. We're just going to bring it right in. It's, it's going to live in its own playlist. Thanks for that idea, Ryan Freeberg. Yes, we're going to have a playlist called The Dungeon DJ. Um, 
Drunkens and Dragons and Music said, combine it, but yeah, use a playlist. Okay, awesome. So this way, Saturday night, if you guys don't have a game going, you'll get the notification when I come on live, and, uh, and it'll be great. So 28 millimeter RPG, another channel. Well, sorry, you're a little bit of an outlier there, my brother. Uh, everybody's saying combine it and use a plate. Okay, cool, cool. Thank you. You guys are the best. See, uh, this is my favorite freaking thing about this revolution we live in. I can just straight hit you. I can just straight hit you up. Yeah, thanks everybody. That is, so there we got one more separated. So I, I'm going to have to satisfy the the great minority by doing the playlist. So they'll, they won't clutter up when you're trying to watch the more core material. Um, and also if you want to play entire playlist, eventually you'll have like 20 hours of this kind of you know, ambient sort of flowing music that occasionally gets into some hard beats and stuff for battle scenes. And I'm trying to visualize for each set a sort of a themed night. So we've done a couple of kind of scary hard ones, and then I'm going to do some like Elysian ones, some more bright ones, and you can be able to choose them. But the thing I wanted to do with the Dungeon DJ was make dungeon music. There's a lot of dungeon music out there. I wanted to make stuff that was much more progressive, that used all new cutting edge stuff from Spotify and didn't kind of leave you in this kind of cinematic whole you know I, I do feel that like fantasy cinematic is a genre of music that really has is getting a bit played out uh, it just sounds you know like -na 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 -na. you know it sounds like Lord of the Rings music and it honestly for me it's like a bit of an energy kill at a session I like a little more thunder and then I like a little more space you know what I mean? and then occasionally I want to hear some like freaking ACDC in there just one point ah kobolds yeah, baby, woo, shoot the thrill, my bugger. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I couldn't get through a stream without dropping an MF, Bob. Okay. Yeah, that that uh, that's me doing all that. So when you see the Dungeon DJ, that's me doing all that. And if you want to talk tools, uh, there's what I use back there. I use um, an Apple MacBook Pro. I use a Hellboy board game as a as a desk. I use a Reloop beat pad. I use a Casio 2850 and a Behringer mastering mixer. And yeah, that's how I do it. And I use 20 years of DJing experience. <laughs> so that, that tool is going to be hard for you to find. Okay. Thank you everybody for sounding off. It shall be done. We're putting it on Runehammer. We're making it a playlist. That's so much less work for me. They also are going to live on Mixcloud. So if you want high res, uh, high, you know, high fidelity versions. They're going to be on Mixcloud. If you want downloadable MP3s of these live sets, they will be downloadable, but only for patrons. So uh, on my Patreon page for one dollar patrons, you'll get all the mix sets in MP3 format. So if you want them in your RSS feed with my podcast, whatever. Okay, enough of that garbage. It is time to talk about Spider Man. No, it's time to talk about July. July of 2019. July of 2019 will be spoken of for an age. The age of the Hecoon Carapace. Okay. These are not toys, man. This stuff, it takes years to pull all this stuff together and maintain it and keep it and keep it updated and keep it working so that you can express yourself fully. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Patreon, uh, my lowest level is $1. For $1, you get 47 hours of podcasts. Um, you get some of my little doodads here and there called side quests. And now you'll be getting the uh, the DM set or the DJ sets. There's five, eight, and twelve dollar levels on Patreon, blah blah blah. Everybody knows about Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash runehammer. Whatever. At the immortal level, that's where you get into our Discord server and you get into our game groups and like it's kind of ultimate level of cool. You get free versions of all my PDFs and stuff like that. But rock on, whatever. You can go do that later. I'm really not here to pitch Patreon. I really am not. I'm, I, I want to talk about like what I'm doing. I'm really happy about Patreon, but the, I feel like the more you pitch it, the, the less palatable it is. Okay, so let's talk about July. What am I going to be doing in July? So we've been talking about the RPG Underground, right? And there's only one topic left, which is layout. And we're going to be talking about layout next. And then I'm going to get into my July project, which is called the Hecoon Carapace. Here, I'm going to type it in so you can see it. It's right here. You can hear me typing, probably. And of course, I made a typo. 
and I can't see because I have no glasses. <laughs> Welcome to my life. <laughs> this is why I'm just going to go backpacking. So I'll just be looking at trees and stuff. I won't know they're blurry. The Hakun Carapace is my project in July. So what I want to do is do a whole fracking project right out in the open. This is something I've never done on YouTube. And it's, I'm honestly quite terrified about it. But basically I'm going to make, I guess what you could call a mini campaign. A mini campaign is something that's maybe three nights of adventure. This is something I've been really getting into as far as a scale of project. Really fun. Um, the recent ones that I did were the Broken Sword and the Tesseract Dagger. So the Broken Sword was the story of the warp shells. They're all these sentient spaceships. We had five different crews of players that were all gathered from the Patreon Discord channel. And then I hosted all the games and crisscrossed all the storylines. And it all got totally insane and wrapped up with some cataclysmic good times. As far as the Tesseract Dagger, we used that adventure arc to test the new ICRPG Magic Book. And we had all these high-powered wizards who were, again, in multiple game groups whose storylines interwove. And I hosted those games as well, primarily in the interest of playtesting the new material, all the new spells and stuff. And that was also, I would consider, sort of like a mini campaign. Um, but what I want to do in July, and it might take a little more than just July, is lock down a creative project right here on YouTube. So what I would do to make something, and then it's gonna just be out there. And since the whole thing's been made in front of everybody, there's really no secrecy to it, so I, don't, I probably won't even charge for it or anything. I think it's just gonna be like, hey guys, you want the, the Hakun Carapace? It's this weird idea I have. Now, I'm not gonna spoil exactly what that is or why it's such an odd combination of words, but that will become evident over time. But what we're gonna do is I want to show you conceptual development and production because they're very freaking different. And I really think this is a little bit the end of my sort of uh, my holler for today. It's been almost an hour. I really think that the difference between concept development and production is sometimes getting a little bit lost in, in indie RPGs. And what this means is that you get some text that says, I need a barbarian with a giant sword who's like got a wolf pelt as a helmet. Okay, and then I'm expected to do a piece of art for that and we're gonna put it in the book. But where's the conceptual development there? I mean, what is this character? Is this the right, is this how they should look? Is this what you're imagining? Well, I don't know, but you're paying me by the hour so we don't really have the chance to draw him 20 times. But I draw everything 20 to 100 to 1,000 times before I really start liking it. Especially if it's a core concept and you guys are gonna see some of this like, torture that I do to figure out this thing called the Hakun Carapace. It's inspired by some stuff from anime, um, but it's also something I've been working on in my brain. I know you guys do this, like you're driving or like doing yard work or like doing laundry or something, but in your mind, you're, you're on a journey into the world of the weird and you're sort of seeing these lines and images and, and ideas and you're not quite sure how they swirl together and make something worthwhile something that other people could understand. And the, pr the process of going from the mental journey into the weird while you're doing yard work to something you can hand to somebody and they can enter that weird world with you. That is the very art and skill of conceptual development and production. Conceptual development being the most short-circuited, very frequently short-circuited part of our hobby. We, we generally, a lot of our hobby is built off of sort of tropes and assumptions. And so conceptual development is, you don't see a lot of it. You don't see 50 versions of a little guy that's in the corner of a page. He's often just sort of stuck down there because he looks OSR, which is the worst term for describing art that I know of. The, the old school had a huge, extremely vast and diverse group of artists working in all kinds of different styles. I mean, take the cover of Star Frontiers versus the covers of the cover of like Tunnels and Trolls or something. This is vastly different styles, right? Or even then take the cover of the Dragon's Lance, the Dragonlance novels, and then oppose that against the interior illustrations of the two ebooks, right? So I don't think saying something is old school is useful as an artistic describer. And yet it's hurled at me as a as a commissioned artist quite often. So 
We're going to talk about conceptual development. We're going to do that for about two weeks. We're going to build up what the Hekun Carapace is, what the gameplay might be, what the story is. We're just going to do it live, just like as it's happening. Then we're going to commit. We're going to get into a PDF. We're going to start writing it out, make some tables, do some maps, make it digestible for people to play at their table, make some print and play stuff. I'll show you guys every trick I have. And then at the end, you've got a sort of finished little sort of, you know, large module, small campaign, kind of, you know, three nights of gameplay kind of a thing. Damn. Yeah, inside baseball, totally, only this isn't baseball. It's RPG life, yo. <laughs> What's up, RPG fam? I'm really, really fighting the urge not to jump on the fam wagon. Fam is like 10 years old, or if not 15. But somehow it like just entered my universe. So I really sound old when I'm dropping fam bombs. You know what I mean? Ah, you can really taste the seltzer. <laughs> okay. That's about it, you guys. That is all the tools that I'm making. Thank you so much for your input on the Dungeon DJ stuff. I know that it seems a little out there, but I got to say as a, as a lifetime DJ... Um, who's done a lot of DJing over the years in different forms. I am extremely proud of, this is another cheesy word I hate to adopt, but the sort of the curation in these mix sets. The, the searching out of this kind of music and then the manual mixing of it. And remember, it's streamed live and it shows my, my uh, equipment and my hands. So there's absolutely no hiding exactly how I'm doing all of it. So I just want to be completely out in the open. I'm really proud, especially that second mix. I'm so happy with that second mix. And it's only the second one. We're going to explore vistas of human terror and redemption that have been heretofore unimaginable. Except maybe in that V'ger scene in the first Star Trek movie. That shit was pretty freaking crazy. <laughs> All right. I get excited sometimes with this stuff. I mean, it's Sunday afternoon. It's nice and sunny out. What am I doing in this dark room? I'll tell you what I'm doing. Playing D and D like bang on bang. Now I said I'm gonna switch, so I need to switch my slogan. It's now playing RPGs. Actually, for the underground, it's making RPGs like big old baddie. Drinking this seltzer water like a big old badass. It's low calorie. I'm watching my figure. <laughs> okay, that's it, guys. So. Thanks again for everything, tuning in, being my homies, being my homettes. The streams are getting bigger than ever now. Thank you guys for tuning in. We're getting up to 150 every time. Let's just keep on growing, being badass. It's nice to be back on YouTube. And it's just happening. It's happening. And final question I need to answer that everybody's been asking. No, I'm not going to Gen Con this year. I'm generally not going to a lot of cons this year. I'm kind of like breathing inward. You know, I got, I got, got some home life I want to focus on. You know what I mean? live that home life a little bit, you know, bring it back to the center point. And then next year, like all the cons, all the time, all the things, it's going to be fantastic. Um, that's about it. Okay. So I hope everybody's having a great game out there. Really excited for a lot of things coming out. Um, I just discovered Mutants of Ix too. That's really old, but I just discovered it. I absolutely love it. It's totally awesome. Kind of getting excited about Pathfinder 2E is coming out. Maybe you don't expect me to say that because of my sort of opinions. But I got to say, the playtest for Pathfinder 2E looked totally bomb. I'm excited about that. And I do have some book reviews returning. It'll probably be in August. We have got a book review showdown between Rapan Athuk and Baramay's Complete. We are going to go head-to-head -head with the two greatest mega dungeons of all time and see who comes out alive. All right, so it's going to be a great summer. You guys, get out there, drink some beer, barbecue up some corn, some fishes. You know, get your friends over, sit in a lawn chair, and talk about dwarves and how someday they'll decimate the elves. <laughs> All right. Strength, honor, beer, keep it real, don't steal. You're always going to get a deal. This is Ingrid Bernal, your old friend here from uh, up in Bar Home in the mountains of Runeham area. I'm going to see you guys on the internet. All right. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And I'll see you next time. A boom 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 da boom da boom a boom 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 da ga ba ga da da ba da boom boom ga boom ga boom ga boom ba da boom 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 ha 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 a da ga
Boop.